Welcome to Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind, a true crime podcast. This is Dominica Best, your host. I have always been interested in the mind and how we and our personalities can explode, damage, hurt, and even kill the people around us. It's why I've been an avid crime fiction reader all of my life, and now I'm a crime fiction author myself. True crime has always been the basis for so much of crime fiction because many times true events are incredibly insightful and also stranger than fiction. I'm not a therapist, but I do create characters for a living. I'm constantly digging deeper into what makes a person, how does their psychology drive their actions, and how do they affect the people around them? Why did they do what they did? These stories are integral to my fiction, and I'm looking forward to delving into the cases with you. Welcome to The Deviant Mind. This episode is not appropriate for all listeners. All of the research I've done on this case has come from Lost Girls, an unsolved American mystery by Robert Coker, the documentary The Killing Season on Discovery+, Plus, various news articles listed in the show notes, but really the depth I go into about these women's lives is thanks to Robert Coker and his conversations with the friends and family members of these women. I've left out so much information due to time constraints, so do please go read this book. Again, that is Lost Girls, an unsolved American mystery by Robert Coker. Welcome back to part two of Lisk, the Long Island serial killer. Last week, we talked about Shannon Gilbert, her life and how she ended up at Oak Beach, as well as the hours before she disappeared. The search for her uncovered four skeletonized bodies wrapped in burlap around Gilgo Beach in a straight patterned line. Each body was found about one-tenth of a mile apart. It was specific. This had of a serial killer, the residents of this part of Long Island and the media said. The Suffolk police, however, stayed silent on that until a press conference where they had to admit that most likely these women were all killed by the same man. However, none of the bodies were Shannon Gilbert. Because her boyfriend Alex Diaz had punched her in the face and fractured her jaw, she had a titanium plate. None of the skulls found had this. These were other victims. Off the record, the police confirmed they believed all of the women were escorts as Shannon had been. The team was looking into open missing person cases and they initially found one. Her name was Megan Waterman and she was from Portland, Maine. She was last seen in June of that year, 2010, at a hotel in Hopwodge, which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly, located just 15 miles from Oak Beach. As reported on CNN by Nancy Grace, the police had contacted Megan Waterman's mom, Lorraine Waterman, for a DNA sample. All the media was talking about was that they had uncovered a serial killer. But the police, and specifically Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dormer, held a press conference after the fourth body was found and is quoted as saying, quote, I don't think it's a coincidence that four bodies ended up in this area, he said. Quote, I don't want anyone to think we have a Jack the Ripper running around Suffolk County with blood dripping from his knife. Dormer blinked, which might be the impression that some people would get. He trailed off. The police didn't mention the word serial killer in the days after. They shut down 10 miles of Ocean Parkway between Tade Beach and Robert Moses Causeway as the canine unit worked the bramble. They also had other police departments looking through their open case files, too, for the identities of the other remains. Suffolk County Medical Examiner Yvonne Milowski guessed the skeletons had been left a year or longer, but the wind, rain, and salt air could have hastened the decomp. The bones were so decomposed that it was hard to tell if they were even female or male. Malowski sent the four skeletons to a nationally recognized forensic anthropologist named Bradley Adams, 
who started testing them for trauma and DNA. Mari Gilbert, Shannon's mom, was confused. Where was her daughter? And were they still going to be looking for her? All the searches stopped right after Christmas as the big snows came. They would have to wait until the spring thaw and would try to go right before all of the growth, like the brambles and the poison ivy, would start growing again. But even though the police were not actively searching for Mara bodies, they were still investigating. They created a task force with three supervisors and a dozen detectives. The task force sought advice from the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit in Quantico, and the agents toured the sites and discussed the case with the detectives. However, there were no leaks about the investigation during this time, so I don't actually know what the BAU said about the specific killer because, as I said before, he has not yet been found. The networks and media kept on with the serial killer angle, and to fill airtime, they were comparing Lusk to Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, and BTK. The media even reached out to Joel Rifkin, who was another Long Island serial killer that was in prison, but he didn't really give any new info and just really enjoyed his time in the spotlight. At the end of January 2011, they finally had DNA hits for the four victims. They were Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello. They all worked freelance as escorts, they came from surrounding towns, and Shannon's disappearance fell in between the four. And as I said before in the last episode, they all looked the same. They were pretty small, tended to be under five feet tall, thin with brown hair. On January 25th, 2011, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dormer and Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spata finally acknowledged they were looking for a serial killer. In this episode, we're going to talk about the first two victims that they had found through the DNA. And I think the rest of the episodes, which there's probably going to be two more, was we are going to go through the timeline of how these women disappeared, who they were, and how they ended up on Long Island. And then the last episode will be about all of the different suspects that have been in the media and wanted by the police and why there haven't been any current arrests made. Okay, so first, we are going to talk about Maureen Brainerd Barnes. She was the first to disappear, although, again, in the last episode, I'm going to talk about other remains that have been found, but they weren't specifically found in burlap and the remains were scattered, but that will be in the last episode as far as what other bodies had been found around the stretch of Long Island and whether or not they were connected. When I was watching a documentary, they were connecting killing escorts from Atlantic City and they went all the way down to, I believe it was Miami and Florida. But again, unfortunately, and this was something I will put in the show notes because I couldn't find this woman's name. But in the documentary that I was watching, she was saying that in 1970, 17% of serial killer victims were sex workers. However, by 2010, 70% of serial killing victims were sex workers because of the fact of technology where now we can try to get what happened in the last hours by CCTV cameras and by money trails and by your cell phone. But when women work as sex workers and specifically as escorts, they tend to use cash and they are the ones that go into the more dangerous areas without cameras and essentially are going into the dark with their johns. And that makes them extremely vulnerable and susceptible. I found that a horrifying and sad fact. And again, I will put in the show notes, I believe she wrote a book about the dangers of sex workers in the last 20 years. And so I, I will definitely link to that. All right. So anyway, going back to Maureen Brainerd Barnes, she was age 25 when she went to Connecticut to Marie Ducharme and Bob Senecal. 
She had two siblings, a younger sister named Missy and a younger brother named Will. At the time of her disappearance, she also had two children named Caitlin and Aiden. Maureen had dark, long hair and green eyes that changed colors to blue or gray depending on her mood. She was known as mellow, a bit immature, didn't take life too seriously, and was a bit on the wild side. She grew up in a subsidized housing development called Pakwanak Village with her mother and her siblings. The family didn't have the most reliable car, so her mother Marie would have to walk two miles to her job as a cleaner at a roadside hotel. Her father stayed in the home only from time to time. He worked in the lumber industry and as a mechanic, and died in an accident in 2003. Marie, her mother, was one of the first employees at Mohegan Sun, and she was making enough money to finally get a car that she could then use for her second job of cleaning hotel rooms at night. And obviously, if she had two jobs, one in the day and one at night, then Marie and her siblings were mostly on their own. Marie would buy them frozen dinners, and Marie would buy them frozen dinners, and Maureen would feed the siblings, and they kept each other occupied. They would play near the train track because they would go into the woods. So again, they were essentially adults <laughs> as kids because they were taking care of each other. Maureen was inward looking and she was very spiritual. She believed she was sky psychic and was very into the supernatural. She started believing that she could foretell when things were going to happen and when people were going to die. One of her sacred texts was the Da Vinci Code and she loved reading about the Illuminati. She preferred reading to school until she started getting attention from boys around middle school. She was very focused on that attention in high school, and sometimes there would be fights with girls over a certain boy. She started skipping school, much to her mother's chagrin, and when she became pregnant with her then-boyfriend, Jason Brainerd Barnes, he asked her to marry him, and she said yes. They married at the Justice of the Peace, and Maureen gave birth to Caitlin. They lived with Jason's grandparents, and then moved south when Jason joined the army. They moved back a couple years later, but unfortunately the marriage didn't last. The split was amicable, and they both decided it would be best for Caitlin to live with her father and Mystic because the schools were better there. Maureen moved in with Missy, her younger sister, who was living in a low-income housing apartment and also had kids of her own. So did Will, the youngest brother. Missy cooked weekly dinners, and they really worked hard to keep their family together as their mother Marie wasn't that much in the picture anymore. Both Missy and Will believed that Maureen was a dreamer, an artist, and very romantic. She loved reading poetry to the kids. However, she was having a really hard time finding a job and really getting a career going. She was writing poetry at this time and decided she wanted to be a rapper while she was working like at the telemarketer, she was working at different fast food places. She was posting her music on her MySpace page and creating marketing materials. And around this time, she had a boyfriend named Steve who ran a pawn shop in Norwich. From reports from her family, he really treated her like a child. As she was using MySpace, she noticed ads popping for modeling jobs. She clicked on some of them and joined modelmayhem.com. She had a photo shoot with a photographer she knew and uploaded the photos to the site. None of the photos themselves were provocative, except for the last one where she was in a long nightgown. But even so, she started getting daily emails about doing nude modeling and escorting. When she found out how much money she could make, she was really surprised. But she didn't want to join an agency because she didn't want to share her money or have a boss. She knew there was another way to make that money, and it was Craigslist. She first started running ads in the local Craigslist, but didn't like how close to home it was. She ended up going into New York City for a couple days a week and setting up appointments there. She had to lie to Steve, her boyfriend, about what she was up to, But she had to tell Missy, because Missy would look after Caitlin when she was in Manhattan. She was making up to a grand of night, which was a lot of money for someone who had been working as a telemarketer and at random fast food restaurants making minimum wage. However, that first year, she was also having premonitions. This was in 2004, and she was having dreams about a serial killer which she also recorded on her MySpace. 
When she got pregnant, she was sure it was Steve's because she always used a condom with her Johns. And they grew close with the pregnancy. And Aiden was born in 2005. Steve was a good father and her trips to Manhattan stopped. But her other jobs weren't really panning out and Steve was the main breadwinner and that was making her very uncomfortable. By 2007, she and Steve had already broken up and Maureen was crashing with her friend Sarah and Sarah's boyfriend. He was a drug dealer and providing Maureen drugs while she was going into Manhattan because there was a whole thing about Coke and John's seemed like it was a big thing. However, Sarah finally broke up with him because of Maureen, because he was stealing her EBT money from her. And Maureen moved on with a friend and they were two months late on rent and were about to be evicted. And Maureen was like, okay, I'm going back to Manhattan to start doing the escorting there again. But she asked her friend Sarah to join her. She showed Sarah all the ropes and introduced her to the guys who put her ads up, as well as some of her clients. Maureen gave Sarah all of the rules she used to keep her safe, and Sarah jumped into the escort business together. They both had chaperones who were friends to help out with their solo calls, but they were having troubles with Craigslist flagging their ads. So before that, they were dealing with this guy named Vip, who was putting the ads for them and then sending them out. But he was taking their money and was kind of a jerk. So they really wanted to go out on their own. And they thought that he was the one that was flagging their Craigslist ads for Craigslist to take down, even though they were not any racier than the other ads. But there were some that slipped through, but they were having problems making the same amount of money that they had been making when they were under this guy VIP. The weekend of July 7th, Maureen and Sarah were in Manhattan and they weren't making the money that they wanted. They decided to have some fun instead, get new photos done, and they went on a shopping spree buying lots of clothes and makeup. They both decided they wanted to move to Manhattan. On Monday, July 9th, 2007, they were supposed to be leaving to go back home but Maureen did not want to go home. She was facing eviction court and they had found an apartment up somewhere where she was going to take a look at it. Sarah said that she was going to be coming back on Wednesday, but she really wanted Sarah to stay with her. But Sarah had a gut feeling and she was like, you know what? We really do need to go home. Matt, who was Sarah's chaperone, insisted that they go home. And he said, listen, you have to listen to your gut. That was the number one rule that Maureen had taught you when you got into this, follow your gut and your gut says, go home. So finally, Sarah said that, but Maureen made her promise that she would come back on Wednesday. And Sarah said that she would. An hour after Sarah left Maureen at the Super 8, which was where they were staying at for the weekend, Sarah got a phone call from Maureen, but she didn't pick up because she was trying to sleep. When Sarah got back to Connecticut, she got a call from a friend in Manhattan. He had talked to Maureen, who had been robbed of five grand. But Sarah knew that Maureen didn't have five grand on her, so something was up. She tried calling Maureen, but she didn't answer. Maureen had called her sister Missy that night as well. She asked for a ride, but it was 11.30 at night, and she wanted Missy's husband Chris to come pick her up from Penn Station. Missy said that Chris had to work in the morning. And so Maureen's like, okay, let me call Will and see if he'll pick me up. But unfortunately, Will was working as well in the morning. That was the last time anyone spoke to Maureen again. By Thursday, July 12th, Missy and Will called the Norwich police. The moment the police learned that Maureen worked as an escort, they no longer took the family seriously. But Missy knew that Maureen would never leave her kids behind like this. Chris and Will found out from Sarah where they had been staying and went into Manhattan to search for her while Missy went to Maureen's apartment. The apartment had been cleared out and all of Maureen's belongings were either in the garbage, like her writing, or her clothes were taken by a friend that claimed that Maureen had given them to her. Maureen's EBT card had been used in Norwich as well, and when 
the family tracked it down, they found that that same friend was using it. So apparently the friend, when Maureen didn't come back, just stole all her stuff. They checked her email and MySpace account, but nothing was posted. Months later, Missy found out that someone tried to access her voicemail and it pinged off a tower near Fire Island, which is in Long Island. This was odd because Maureen never took jobs on Long Island. When their brother Will died in a motorcycle accident on August 14, 2009, and Maureen didn't show up for his funeral, Missy knew that her sister was dead as well. And hers was the body that was found on December 13, 2010 in a burlap bag. The second woman in the timeline who went missing from the Gilgo Four was named Melissa Bartholomew. She was seen outside of her apartment in the Bronx on July 12, 2009, and that was the last time anyone saw her. Her sister Amanda would receive seven phone calls from a man claiming to be her killer after she had disappeared. So some backstory on Melissa. Melissa Bartholomew was born on April 14, 1985, to Lynn Bartholomew. Lynn was 16 years old at the time, and even though Melissa's father had asked her to marry him, she declined. Well, she said yes first, and then when she saw what kind of husband he would be, she declined him. She was strong-willed and wanted to finish high school at all costs. Her parents helped babysit Melissa while Lynn was in school. Lynn did graduate and kept working washing dishes at a local nursing home while Melissa stayed home with her grandparents. They lived in Buffalo, New York in a diverse neighborhood. Lynn moved her and Melissa out of her parents' house when she met a man and they moved 10 miles south to South Buffalo. That relationship ended with the man cheating on her and Lynn moved her family back in with her parents. Several years later, Lynn met a man named Andre Funderburg, and they had a daughter named Amanda. Melissa, like her mother, was not afraid to stand up for herself and was very strong-willed. Unlike her mother, she didn't feel the need to finish high school and started to skip school and party all the time. The one thing that Lynn said she wasn't worried about was her daughter getting pregnant. Her daughter was very specific that she was not going to have children until she was 35 and was very careful about that. Lynn, not knowing what else to do with Melissa, sent her to live in Dallas with her dad and his wife. Melissa, however, hated Dallas, and when she stole her dad's van, and because she was so tiny, the cops didn't actually think she even had a license, even though she was 16 at the time. But she got caught by the police, and her dad was fined money, I believe, and he pretty much sent her back to live in Buffalo. Things were a bit tense at home with Lynn, and when Melissa started dating a guy named Jordan, things got worse. Lynn and her boyfriend Jeff did not like Jordan at all. He thought he was an extremely bad influence on Melissa. But as I said, she was very strong-willed, and she moved out of her mom's house senior year of high school, but to everybody's surprise got an apartment, and started working at a pizzeria to pay her bills. Something must have scared her straight because she enrolled in high school and managed to graduate with all A's. At this time, she went from working to a pizzeria to working at Jeff's Diner, which she had opened up. And from what her family said, she really wanted to be a small business owner. She felt that that was going to be her future. And Lynn said that she would be driving her to school and she would see her writing in a notebook about all these plans she had to make enough money to open up her own beauty salon. Melissa had decided to go to beauty school and asked and her mother said she would do it to sign a loan for the $9,000 to get her through the school. She did a fantastic job at the beauty school and she did graduate. However, the only job after she could get was at Supercuts. And she was bored, and she didn't like the kind of work that she was doing. At this time, Jordan had come back into the picture, and they were dating again. And in 2006, they took a trip to Manhattan together. Supposedly, Jordan's uncle owned a recording studio down there. And in the upcoming weeks, they kept going back and forth to Manhattan, and Melissa announced to her mother that she was moving to New York City that they had met a man 
named Johnny who had a hair salon down there and he was going to hook her up with a job. Lynn tried to dissuade her and told her how expensive it was, but Melissa told her that she had a hookup and she'd be okay. Once Melissa reached New York City, however, something happened to the salon and she was no longer working at it. She had dumped Jordan for Johnny, the man who said he was going to hook her up with the salon, but no one called him Johnny. Everyone called him Blaze, and Blaze was a pimp. Within months, Melissa, who was working under the name of Chloe, was working as a sex worker out on Times Square. Her and her friend Critzia would hang out in front of Lace, a strip club at 7th Avenue, north of 48th Street. And again, this is going back to the book that I've gotten so much of this information from, Lost Girls. And he actually did a lot of research as to even the hierarchy of pimps and escorts, who was working on the streets, who was working for a company, who was working in a strip club. There was a whole hierarchy. And Blaze, Melissa's pimp, was pretty much the sidekick of a really powerful pimp named Mel, who was Critzia's pimp. And so Critzia and Melissa became very good friends and they kind of owned the streets from what Lost Girls, the book, was talking about. And Melissa didn't really see Blaze as this all-powerful pimp and she didn't give him all her money because she felt he didn't do enough to protect her. And Again, the hierarchy of pimps and the girls they work for, I guess a lot of times they all live in the same house. However, Blaze had another sex worker that was underneath him, I guess, however you say that. And Melissa was always angry being like, oh, that's your main wife because she had seniority. And so she lived with Blaze and Critzia, but Melissa had her own apartment with a lot of cats. And so she was keeping a lot of the money and she was also getting tired of the street. She didn't like walking all night long and she started taking jobs on the side without Blaze's protection. Critzia warned her that this was dangerous, but she said she didn't care. Soon, she'd broken it off with Blaze and in the spring of 2008, Melissa was solely working through Craigslist. On a visit, her sister Amanda saw all the town cars picking her up from the Bronx. She was nine years younger than Melissa, and they would do lots of fun things in New York, like seeing the Statue of Liberty, going to parks and museums. But at night, Melissa would leave her alone in her apartment and would go to her assignations. Now, at this point, Melissa only did what are called outcalls, which are she would set up an ad and she would get a phone call from the customer, and they would give her an address and send a car to pick her up. And then she would get taken to that place for the job. Now, of course, this sounds extremely dangerous because she doesn't have any control. And Critzia was really worried about how much danger she was putting herself in. Because at least on the street, you had a chance to make a snap judgment. And you had the pimp that was watching out for you and the other girls. But without calls, you were in the dark on your own. And that was the most vulnerable time for a sex worker. All of this was concerning to Amanda, but she was the little sister and she didn't really tell Lynn and Jeff what Melissa was up to. However, her entire family was urging Melissa to come back home to Buffalo. And in that week before her disappearance... Lynn really tried to push that hard, including Jeff, who called her as well. But Melissa said, you know what, not yet. I'm almost ready, but I'm just not quite there yet. On July 11th, Melissa sent Amanda a late night text about an upcoming visit that Amanda was coming down to New York City. And there was video from a local bank the next day on the 12th that shows Melissa depositing a grand into her bank account which is typically how much out calls were. So that was a price for a night's work. Phone records show that Melissa talked to Blaze that day, and when police later talked to him, he said she had an out call somewhere on Long Island. 
He claimed to know the place and the john, and Blaze offered her a ride to the job, but she said no. The last time anyone saw her was sitting on the curb outside her apartment. Melissa stopped returning all calls on July 13th. Lynn and her boyfriend Jeff called the hospital searching for her and called off Amanda's trip. Melissa's landlady was worried too when the cats were scratching on the door. When they tried to file a missing persons report, and this is July 13th, 2009, when they tried to file a missing persons report, the police refused them, saying she was 24 years old and of sound mind with no psychiatric issues. The police also said because she was missing to her family didn't mean she was missing. And when the family attorney spoke to the Buffalo police, they essentially told him they wouldn't be assigning a detective to someone like a missing sex worker, which is horrifying. It took the police 10 days to start the missing persons investigation and to subpoena Melissa's phone records and to canvas the neighborhood and pull DNA samples from her toothbrush. They found her voicemail was accessed on the night of her disappearance pinging off a tower in Massapequa, Long Island. The police visited two motels on Long Island, the Budget Inn and Best Western, but they didn't find her there, nor was she on any of the recordings. The family believes that the police finally took notice four days into her going missing on July 16th because Amanda's phone rang and the caller ID said it was Melissa. Amanda was so excited and relieved to hear from her, so she answered going Melissa, but instead a man answered. He had a controlled voice, he was comfortable and soft-spoken, and said, Oh, this isn't Melissa. On May 2, 2011, Amanda and Lynn met with the other mothers and sisters of the Gilgo Four and with Mary Gilbert at a lunch with the writer Robert Colker to meet talk about their loved ones, and have a vigil to keep their loved ones' names in the papers, to try to change the narrative and see them as human beings with families that cared for them. Amanda couldn't say much to these women about the phone calls from the killer because the police were keeping that info under wraps. What she did tell them was that she was sure he was a white guy and that he sounded like he was in his 30s or 40s. In the last call he made to her on August 26th, he told her that he'd killed Melissa. The police were able to trace the calls to cell towers near Madison Square Garden and Times Square. But as far as anyone could tell, that's as far as anyone had gotten with those phone calls. To this day, when you look at different articles and all the different theories online about who this killer is, there hasn't been very much progress made on those phone calls outside of the content in them. On next week's episode, we'll talk about the circumstances behind Megan Waterman's and Amber Lynn Costello's disappearances. Also, I'll go into the other bodies found around that area, Jessica Taylor being one of them, and finally the discovery of Shannon Gilbert's remains. There were also some cases that investigators thought might be additional LISC victims, but stay tuned next week. That is all coming. So thank you again for joining me on The Deviant Mind, and I'll be back next week. Thank you. This episode was sponsored by The Creek Killer, Book one in the Harriet Harper thriller series written by me, Dominica Best. What would you do if you read The Police Found Your Body in a Creek? Find out in The Creek Killer, available on Amazon. Thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. If you like my show, please give me a rating and review. It helps other listeners find this podcast. Follow Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit thebeststorytellingnetwork.com where you'll find show notes, my books, links to social media, and much more. Join my Patreon for special subscriber perks, like two extra exclusive episodes a month and a Q&A with me at patreon.com forward slash the deviant mind podcast. Until next time.